Hey guys, in this spot, we're gonna be checking out the brand new Sideshow Collectibles Star Wars IG-88 six scale figure. IG-88, along with the other bounty hunters, first made their appearance in Empire Strikes Back, which debuted May 17, 1980. This assassin droid will come included with the same hexagonal black display stand that we've seen with other Star Wars releases, right down to the crotch clip where the figure will stand on top of. Flip the base upside down, you can see that there's the Star Wars logo. Nothing really on the top, as something I wish they would entertain is actually putting a print on the top of the stand itself, but you do at least have Star Wars on the underside here. Despite its lanky makeup, the IG-88 actually stands perfectly fine. It doesn't really need the display stand, and a lot of that can be contributed to the fact it has very flat feet. This allows for a much-needed footage uh, footprint when displaying him on shelves. Um, you could de technically display him with display stands, but always the problem with coming with display stands is that they do add additional space around the figure. If you're a little tight for space confinements and you know you only have so many figures that you can put on display, at least he stands fine. He doesn't technically even really need a stand. When you get a packaging, one thing you will want to add to it is the fabric bandolier that comes included. Um, being that the way it's strapped together, it's it's a real fabric looped through an actual, exactly like a belt. This, the actual fastener part in which the belt loops itself through is plastic, so we do be very careful of that. Um, I would say though, you will need to loosen it, if not completely take it out from the actual buckle portion to fit it over the frame. It's just simply not... Uh, loose enough to fit through the arms or over the head. So I would loosen this ever so slightly, or if, if anything, take it completely and open it completely, loop it around, and then loop it back through itself. Unfortunately, through the process of doing that, it does develop a little bit of wear on the fabric itself, but I would rather that than run the risk of breaking anything tr while trying to loop the bandolier over its torso. What's neat about the bandolier though, is if you flip it around, there's a couple of magnetic points on the back where you can take his supplied grenades and they're magnetic. So you very simply attach them to the back areas of the bandolier and it fits all three. The other neat thing about this particular figure too is it does have a light up optic eye. And to access that, you wanna just unscrew this part, slide it out and the batteries luckily are already included. The only thing that I did take out, there was a little plastic restriction, a power restrictor that was just fitting in between the batteries and the prongs to prevent the batteries from turning on. So with the batteries in place, now I don't really like the way that this goes back into the head. Uh, they've given you prongs on either side where the battery compartment is, and then they've given you uh, they've given you like little slots where essentially this goes in and then twists. It's hard to really line up where those prongs line themselves up to the little slot portions. I found a lot of times I just kept putting it in and then twisting it, seeing if I could actually lock it into place. You don't necessarily succeed at doing it the first time around. I wish if anything it was magnet or really for the nature of the way it sits itself into the socket doesn't even really need clips. Those clips could be completely left off and it would simply just slide itself through the cavity of the top of the head. The clips become a little bit of a nuisance. Again, especially the fact that you have to line up where exactly they go. You, you, know, you do have to do it a couple of times probably before you can get it properly to line up. And then once it's lined up, you just simply twist it back into place and then you can have access to IG-88's light up functions. To activate the light, you just press this down on the top there and it does light up. It doesn't light up bright, mind you, but it lights up enough that at least this portion or where we would assume its eye to be, at least that does light up. Getting a look at the figure itself, it I think it turned out quite nice. It uh, 
I think many fans of Star Wars, generally, when they think bounty hunters, they tend to think Boba Fett. And then it's either a tie for second place with either Bosk or it's IG-88. Coincidentally enough, when they first make their appearances in Empire Strikes Back, Bosk is actually with IG-88 kind of standing side by side as Vader is walking by addressing the rest of the bounty hunters. So he has a memorable enough appearance in Empire Strikes Back. He really doesn't make much in the way of appearances afterwards, but he does have a fairly memorable appearance in Empire Strikes Back being paired next to Bosk. The figure itself, again, is a good representation of how he appears in the movie, though brief, yes. Um, I think Sideshow has done a pretty good job on the figure as a whole. Um, as you could probably guess it, though, the makeup, material makeup of IG-88 here is primarily, if not all, plastic. So you do have, unfortunately, some aspects of it where, because he is so thin, i.e. like areas such as the legs and the arms, um, and because he is plastic, he's certainly not a uh, a figure that you want to be like forcing into some really crazy uh, poses. Um, you, you know, you can get some bends and stuff like that in his arms and his, you know, in the elbow and shoulder areas, but it's very limited and not to the point where I would really start stressing it. One of the interesting things, though, is uh, if you look at the production and prototype photos of IG-88, uh, Sideshow actually has it where the legs extend outward. And I will say that they do extend very, very little. There's, it does create a little bit of a gap where you can uh, extend the pistons of his leg. Now I will say though, because this is plastic, I've done this at a very careful uh, degree, like applying just a bit of pressure to extend the legs outward. Uh, basically, once you've got them extended outward, I wouldn't be forcing them back in and pulling them back out too often. Um, again, they, they seem like it's a pretty secure connection, but because these are plastic after all, you know, you don't want to be pulling and, and forcing these too often. Um, but it does give them the much needed height that, you know, the, the droid itself would definitely, uh, would definitely need. He's got some great details here in the torso where you can see like all these individual pistons and levers and everything that would make up the droid itself. Not only do you have a really nice almost silver gunmetal color, but they've gone in and then given it a dry, sort of dry brushing of a rusted color to give the droid a sense of age, which I quite like. Uh, especially when you start moving things such as his arms out of the way, you can really get a lot of that rusted vibe going, especially like around this area here where more of the mechanical aspects of the droid would be moving. He gets a lot of that rust, but it seems more predominantly featured up the top torso. It's still generously sprinkled throughout the aspects of the figure. But again, most, if not all of it, seems to be closer to the top area here. A closer look at his arm reveals, well, it's not quite a hand as much as it is a, a clamp, which opens and closes. The one hand is a little bit larger than this hand over here, but does function the exact same way. It gets a little bit of rotation going on here. Um, unfortunately, these are a little on the loose side, so holding such as his blasters and his other accessories that we will look at in a second is a little bit trickier. Um, one thing I do like, though, is that they capped the, the hinge joint, and this is more so to the design of IG-88 anyways, but I like that they incorporate a, uh, a rubber cap over top of where the hinge of the elbow would reside. Again, you've got a very thin profile, very thin makeup, of IG-88's arms, as well as his legs, which I do really like these extra tubes um, that they've sculpted in, which are a more softer plastic or softer rubber versus uh, the harder plastic for his frame. The head sculpt, if you could call it a head sculpt, is very accurate to how he appears in the movie. It does rotate, so you know you can change around and mix and match how you want to have it uh, have him displayed. I do like that it does rotate, and it does technically allow you to rotate it up here as well. So it does have two points, here and here, as your main areas where you can rotate the figure. It doesn't have a ball joint, mind you. Not that it would necessarily need to have a ball joint, but it does add some additional uh, way to articulate and move the head for displaying the figure. Some very clever sculpting here on the shoulder portions, basically these little fabric cushions that would be on the shoulder areas and then the bandolier would you know drape itself over top of that this looks like it should be fabric but it, it, it's in fact actually plastic if you could believe it 
Um, it has just enough bit of paint to it that it does give it the, the sense that this should be padded, but it is plastic though, which is quite nice. Here's the back and makeup of the back of IG-88's torso. Again, you've got the larger tubes and pistons. Basically, I, I would imagine a lot of these are just like uh, gas tanks that are basically fueling uh, all the compressed air that would be fueling the, the pistons in the motion so he would be able to move his torso. But some fantastic looking sculpting here. Again, making use a little bit of that rust we were talking about before. Not as much down here, but again, some really nice sculpted details. By the way, we didn't get this out of the way. If you're wondering how tall IG-88 is, IG-88 stands at 14 inches tall. For his accessories, he of course has the fabric bandolier that we've already looked at, and he comes with the grenades, we'll look at those in a second. But he does also come included with a Blastec DLT-20A blast rifle, which you can see is cast in black plastic, and gets a very minimal amount of that silver dry wash over top of it, just enough to give it that sense of age. Also included along with that is the Blastec E11 Blaster, the tried and true go-to for many of the Empire uh, soldiers and whatnot. It does have a swing out arm clip, arm guard, and that just clips to the underside like so. It doesn't get as much of that silver wash, but it does get just a little bit um, on the side here. Then of course, as we've already discussed, he does come with some grenades. We spin the figure around. They're still vel they're still velcro, they're still magnetized on the back side here. And though you really can't, I suppose you could theoretically have them holding it. Um, I would just outright, I would just more so display it on the bandolier myself. Going back to his weapons though, um, you you would think that the ar the arms and the hands specifically wouldn't hold the weapons the greatest. And you may be right in that regard. The clamps just are too loose uh, to, to hold the rifle, for example, or blaster on their own independently. However, one thing that Sideshow did do that was clever is that they gave little helping points for displaying the weapons. So which kind of makes then the weapons uh, specific to one hand over the other. The rifle, for example, does sit into his hand, but as you could probably guess, it doesn't sit the most securely. However, there's that little peg right on the end of the rifle, and there's a hole in his forearm. So you just attach the peg into the hole, just into the hole. It's sometimes harder to line it up, but line it up, fit it into place. There we go. And then once that's in place, you can see he holds it much easier. The same thing can be said also for the blaster. Uh, in, instead though, instead of actually having a peg on the back of the blaster, what it does have is a hole. And then there's this elevated peg on the arm, so we just want to extend out the, the clamp, line it up, and you want to line that peg into the hole area of the blaster, and you just want to press that down into place, and then it will actually hold it. Now again, you would just want to spin the figure around, it's easier to probably do it on this side. Line it up. There's your hole and your peg. Attach that into place. There we go. And then you can just have the gripped hands go around it. And he actually does a pretty good job, good job of holding them once those are factored in. And uh, surprisingly, again, he holds them very well for the fact that he's really only got clamped hands. Two things I was very pleasantly surprised to find was, first of all, that the six scale figure had as much articulation that he did. I really was thinking that you were gonna be very limited with what you could do with the arms, but as you can clearly see, not only does he hold the blasters really well because of those little helping points on the figure, but he has a much more broader range of articulation than what I initially thought. For its articulation, we've already looked at this already, but it does have a swivel point right at the top here where you can rotate this all the way around full 360 and then it has a secondary rotation here where basically the head attaches itself to the torso. While the arms don't appear to be able to move forward or back they do allow you the option of hinging the arms outward which is a nice touch. They've left just a gap clearance here where the arms can actually hinge outward so I like that. You can rotate the forearms basically right where not the bicep area, but certainly where the mid arm would connect itself to the shoulder or right just below the shoulder. Then when you get to this section here, this rotates. So basically you've got hinge, swivel, 
and then swivel down here. And then as we've already looked at before, you've got the hinge joint that's concealed within the rubber, uh, like the rubber accordion here, and that hinges back and forth. It does also allow you to rotate the, the arms. I say arms, but like right underneath the elbow area, you can rotate them there. And then these would open and close with allowing a rotation there as well. Obviously, due to the nature of the way the lower torso is constructed, there's no articulation there. However, he does have, or it has, I keep wanting to say he, does have articulation where you can move the legs out and forward and back. A very mild ball joint. There's a ball joint basically being concealed underneath this lower uh, part of its leg covering, so to speak. Uh, it does have a hinge on the knee and it also does allow you to rotate the knee. And as we've already discussed, it does have the piston where you can extend the leg. Again, being very careful to do that because this is a plastic uh, frame, um, but it does have the hinge on the knee there. You also can rotate the foot and it looks like there is just a little bit of a, of a rock here as well, just like so. Again, loving the fact that he's got nice flat feet. So even if you don't display him, and I know it's sometimes limited to have so many stands, say in a detolf, where you just can't have so many figures stacked one next to the other, uh, at least with him having flat feet like this, he stands perfectly fine, really, without his display stand. Personally, I'm loving the fact that Sideshow Collectibles are releasing more bounty hunters for the very large Star Wars universe. Uh, I IG-88, I think, turned out quite nicely. Part of me wishes that he could have been metal, kind of in the same way that C-3PO and R2-D2 could have really been shined well in a, in a metal treatment. But I get the fact that obviously for a metal version of this guy and a metal version of the other droids, the cost of those would be much more, uh, much more expensive. Uh, by keeping this guy to a plastic, you also can keep the cost down and it allows for Sideshow to release more pieces, which I think really for me is the end goal that I'm hoping for. I'm hoping for more Star Wars characters that despite the fact I wish this guy could have been metal, I think plastic works perfectly fine. The sculpt is good, and I especially like those rusted undertones that they put in the torso and all the different limbed areas of this particular assassin droid. Looks great. He's going to look great on my display along with my other bounty hunters, and I can't wait for more releases from Sideshow. Speaking of releases for Sideshow, this guy currently is available. So if you guys want to head over to Sideshow Collectibles website, uh, he's currently available for $215, which I think is very affordable for what you're getting with this guy. And he is only going to be a limited release of 2,000 pieces. So for example, if you already have some of the other bounty hunters on your display and have been ankling and itching to get yourself an IG-88, now is your chance. Head over to Sideshow Collectibles and you can get this guy right now. Today, once again, we are having a look at the Sideshow Collectibles Star Wars IG-88 Assassin Droid. If you guys like this video, certainly hit it with a like. And if you haven't had a chance to subscribe to this channel yet, what are you waiting for? Hit that little subscribe button down below. It'll mean you won't miss a beat when it comes to future videos coming onto this channel. And if specifically you want to check out some more Sideshow Star Wars pieces, I got a playlist on this channel specifically dedicated to just that. As always, guys, thanks for watching as you always do. I'll see you next time.